September 15th through October 15th, we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, our national observance of the diverse cultures and rich histories of the Hispanic and Latino American communities. This important commemoration provides us the opportunity to shine a light on the immeasurable contributions of Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And without question, an integral part of Hispanic Heritage Month is recognizing those awe-inspiring individuals who've played such a crucial role in advancing our country. For me, it doesn't get more awe-inspiring than having the unique opportunity to hear from a celebrated NASA astronaut, physicist, and engineer. Our very special guest speaker today is a true American hero. Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, the first Hispanic NASA astronaut and a real life space pioneer who has logged seven space flights, more than 1600 hours in space and three spacewalks. Born and raised in San Jose, Costa Rica, Dr. Chang Diaz dreamed of being an astronaut. And after graduating from high school, he moved to the United States where he re-enrolled himself in high school in order to learn the language and fully immerse himself in his new country. And immerse himself he did, earning a PhD in plasma physics from MIT in 1977 and becoming a US citizen that very same year. Fast forward to 1986, Dr. Chang Diaz took to the stars for the first time aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia. He returned to space six more times, tying the record for the most space flights and helping to change the culture at NASA by showing that scientists, not just fighter pilots, had the right stuff to serve as astronauts. He was instrumental in the construction of the International Space Station, working alongside fellow astronauts from Russia, Japan, Canada, and Europe on its construction, its repair, and its enhancements. He also served as director of the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center from 1993 to 2005, when he retired from NASA and founded Ad Astra Rocket Company, where he has been dedicated to the advancement of the Vasimir Plasma Rocket Propulsion Technology and the implementation of renewable and green energy solutions. I'm excited to hear Dr. Chang Diaz discuss his own incredible journey, as well as offer insights on how each of us can lead and contribute more impactfully across the 7-Eleven family of brands. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the discussion with Dr. Chang Diaz. Hello everyone, I'm Amy Vanderoff, and on behalf of the 7-Eleven family of brands, it is my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. Dr. Chang Diaz, hello, mucho gusto. Gracias, <laughs> igualmente, mucho gusto. So nice to meet you, and what a treat to have you. And I, I want to start at the beginning, born in Costa Rica, raised in Costa Rica. I'd love to go back and start the interview here. How did this conversation go in the late 1960s when you said to your family, I want to be an astronaut and I want to do this in the United States? How did this ticket get purchased going into the United States? How did this entry happen? And what did your family think? Well, you know, there was a lot of um, um, pushback. And, um, but actually, I, w I have to say that my, my mother so... Um, that uh, desire, that dream as a, as a way for me to, to study. I was not the model student that, uh, that you might expect. Uh, at the time when I was a teenager, you know, I was more interested in uh, sports and, uh, you know, dating girls and all the things that uh, young teenage boys might, might be interested in. <laughs> everything except uh you know studying and my my mother was worried about that uh justifiably so and so you know i said well i'm gonna 
be an astronaut? He said, well, astronauts have to study. They have to uh, be uh, scientists. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, well, no, that's not true. Um, <clears throat> most of the astronauts that I have been following are military pilots, and they just know how to fly fl airplanes. And I said, well, that's true now, but eventually the people who are going to be going up into space to do exploration, they need to understand the uh, environment and the physics, what makes, makes it work. And so you better get your act together. <laughs> so, and that kind of came, um, it, 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 that message uh, drove home. And I, um, I was able to, to kind of um, kick it up a little bit and, uh, and, 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 and dedicate more of my time to studying. And I did, I did fairly well right at the end of, of high school. So, but um, most people in Costa Rica would not consider that as a real viable uh, career. And, you know, people would just chuckle when, when I said that um, my, my goal was to become an astronaut. Let's move on to some adversity and challenges. I know there were many. I'm sure coming here to the United States at that time was not an easy journey for you. You're leaving your family, your native language. So many things to overcome. How did you overcome many of those obstacles during that time? One step at a time, it was for me. Um, and I had a lot of help. A lot of people helped me along the way. And I think that that is... Um, you know, one of the mottos uh, that I have developed uh, of, of during my life is that no one gets anywhere without someone else's help. And I have had a lot of that help. In um, At the beginning, um, I had to find a way to the United States. My family was not a well-off, well well-to-do family. Um, but my father was able to um, get me um, a one-way ticket to the United States. And, you know, it seemed uh, that he wanted to get rid of me. Not at all. Um, he said, you know, Franklin, I will, I can only afford a one-way ticket, um, but if you um, have a lot of problems and, you, you know, you really need to, to get back, uh, just write to me and, and uh, I'll find a way to get you back. But you know, in those days, a letter would take months to get there, and and the response would be another month or so. He knew. He said, "You know, if I give you the two uh, the return ticket, you will be back very soon. As soon as you uh, encounter your 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 first uh, really tough problem." And I I can tell you um, that he was right. If, if I had. If I had had that uh, return ticket, I probably would have used it. And I don't know if I would have come back. But anyway, so all of that happened as it, as it did. And um, I came to the United States, had to learn English, had to find my way. And, and so one step at a time, one little step after the other. Uh, and that is the way it, it worked for me. Well, in 1980, you became the first Hispanic NASA astronaut, later flying seven missions and logging 1,600 hours in space. What did it mean to you to be the first Hispanic NASA astronaut? Well, for me, it was, of course, the realization of a, of a lifelong uh, dream. Uh, I never really expected or anticipated the sort of the notoriety that came with it. That was one thing that I did not plan for. And the, the sort of the responsibility that comes to you when you become a public figure, that happened to me in Costa Rica right away as soon as that uh, I, I was selected. And then flying back um, to Costa Rica for me is, there's a tremendous level of attention that, uh, you know, people around uh, the street, uh, and um, anywhere I go, people say hello, and the, the young people mostly. Um, you know, you, 
I, I, I have become aware that I, I am a bit of a role model for for the youth, and that is the, the one the one fear that I that I have every time I'm, I'm in the public is when a young boy or young girl comes, they want to have a photo and or they want an autograph or something. I I just drop everything and hey, let's do it um, because I felt that if somebody that I looked up to when I was little did, um, uh, you know, some kind of a, a bad gesture to me, I would have gotten turned off and, and may, may, have, may have derailed my career. So uh, I'm very aware of that responsibility. That's the way it feels now. And you have taught so much to so many, but that personal responsibility of paying it forward and having teachable moments with youth because you were in that position at one point, doing the impossible, taking that leap of faith, it's really commendable. And, and you've really expressed how important it is for you to show the message of representation, of showing young people that they can do and achieve and dream Elaborate for us why it's so important to see it. Why does representation matter? That's um, no. That's how you relate. Uh, that's how you relate to what what the things are that you can do. When you see your father, or your mother do something, I mean, you relate to these people um, by your relationship with them, uh, and that tells you, uh, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, that has been my message from, from day one. You know, I was not a model student, a brilliant student. Uh, I, I'm just a regular guy, you know, just about as, as average as they come. And, you know, if I can do this, um, pretty much anybody can do it. Now, representation regarding the way you look, uh, <clears throat> you know, a person of color. Um, if you don't see persons of color, in a certain type of activity, and you wonder, well, maybe since I am a person of color, uh, maybe I, I can't do this for whatever reason. And you, you just don't even try, you know? So you have to have that representation there uh, so that people can, you know, look and see that there is a spot for you, potentially, if you do the work. So. You know, it all kind of repeats itself. It's a, it's a sort of self-progressing uh, progression that hopefully we don't break. And I think that is part of the responsibility. During your 25-year career with NASA, you supported some of the agency's major milestones and accomplishments. When you look back at your rich history, what are you most proud of? I was part of a team. I was... Uh, a member of a crew, uh, I related to my crewmates, uh, and I want to make sure that space is eventually open to everyone. You know, there's, it doesn't make sense if space is the realm of only a few selected individuals who get there by, by their effort or by their, nowadays, by their money. Um, Space is a place of work, uh, it's a place of business, it is, it is the future of humanity. And we are opening up that future because this planet uh, really needs a little bit of relief. Take us back and expand upon more, if you can, about the Soviet space program and about that time that you were collaborating with Russian cosmonauts. What did you learn from that experience? I learned that we were doing things very similarly, uh, I learned that uh, there were people just like we were uh, at a time uh, when we, when I started in the program in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union was the enemy. It was a strange, sort of mysterious place, sort of secretive uh, place, and and. Um, we, we did not understand their technology well enough. And so we got to Moscow on our first uh, meeting with the, the uh, uh, Russian space uh, program. And, and I can tell you, it, it was winter time, but it was colder than winter time because 
they did not want us there, and we did not want to be there either. And that was the, the chemistry that, that started the, the conversation. Uh, in the table, we had the Russians at one side and the Americans on the other side. There was an interpreter on this end from Russia and another interpreter on this other end from uh, the United States. And the first thing that we heard is, why are you here? We don't want you here. And we said, well, we don't want to be here either. But we were told we had to be here. Yeah, and we also were told that we have to do this. So we might as well get to work. And that was the beginning of the relationship. We, we, we started to know the, these folks and you know, get to know their families. Uh, they invited us to their home. They opened up their, uh, uh, their homes, uh, dinners and conversation and discussions. And pretty soon we just both recognized that, that we were just the same, that we're not different from each other. We found that uh, we're just regular people, just like everybody else. And <clears throat> they had interests in same, same interests. Uh, you know, they all have spouses and children and they want to have a good a good um, you know life for their children just like we do uh, they worry about the same things and um wonderful people i mean i remember that the the relationships that we uh, established with the the cosmonauts are relationships that are forever and it was a really nice uh relationship that evolved over the years and we had a lot to learn from them and they had a lot to learn from us it was a really great thing that we did this. And that is why we ended up on the International Space Station today. I mean, they're just um, friendships that uh, will never be broken, no matter what happens on the planet. I mean, we just, uh, you know, we share that experience and, and that is uh, extremely sacred for us. Hopefully space um, will help bring people together. You've seen so much change since you came to the United States. As you've explained, you've experienced trials and tribulations. You've overcome. You've been able to be adaptable and change as things changed. So many people watching need some inspiration and motivation on that piece of it. Can you explain how you can remain adaptable and in an ever-changing world, keep pursuing your own path while being flexible in your mind? Adaptability is, is fundamental. And yes, when I came to the U.S., for heaven's sakes, the country was tearing itself apart. I mean, it was, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, the counterculture, the civil rights movement, um, all the changes in the arts and the music, and all of that going on. And then we landed on the moon, you know, a tremendous achievement that was an achievement of the whole the whole of humanity not just the united states i think the the country the thing that i admire the most about um about the united states is that society is willing to change society is is not static it's a, it's a society that that is malleable is changing thanks to a lot of immigrants who come in from different cultures and bring in their their traits and their, their, their customs and, and, and their ideas. And, and, and all of that continues to, you know, to sort of re remake and remanufacture continuously, you know, the great American experiment. And that, I think to me, that's one of the most beautiful things about this country that we, we just need to preserve. You know, and during Hispanic Heritage Month, we showcase the efforts of Hispanic Americans and their contributions, and we learn about their role and what they've done and where they've been. But we also inspire the next generation. Where do you see that future contributions from Hispanic Americans in our society, in our country? I'd say everywhere, you know, in the arts, in the sciences, in the humanities, in, in politics. Um, and, and I think that uh, we have 
we have everything that it takes, just like every other group that makes up, you know, the quilt of the American society, we have what it takes. And I think Hispanics need to play their role in, the, in, in shaping the, uh, you know, the ethos of, of, of the country. There is a lot going on right now. There's a lot of migration. The planet is changing because of all the changes in the climate. You know, people are moving. People are moving from places where life is very difficult to places where life is less difficult. And the reaction usually is put up barriers, put up walls, put up fences, because we don't want all these folks to come in. That is a problem that we need to address. <clears throat> we need to recognize that we all own this earth. This earth is really for all of us. And we have to find a way to accommodate the needs of our humanity. And, and his, Hispanics are just as responsible as everybody else to make sure that that notion is, is accomplished. Hispanic Americans um, have, have contributed already a tremendous amount. So it's been a journey of struggle and success and um, you know, innovation and, 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 and in many areas. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a continuing effort and continued activity. And we need to document that. We need to make sure that that is something people understand uh, and people recognize. I've heard you say many times in multiple interviews, Dr. Chang Diaz, that you consider yourself a global citizen. As you were up in space looking down, we're all the same, we're all human beings. Elaborate on that. It's true. Um, many astronauts, in fact, I, I should say almost uh, all of us, all the astronauts that I know, we consider ourselves citizens of planet Earth. And someday the, the day will come when humanity will be mostly living outside of the Earth. You know, and, and the Earth, I'm talking, you know, maybe 100 years from now, maybe couple hundred years from now, the Earth, um, if we take care of it, will essentially become a national park um, of humanity, you know, a, 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 a protected area, um, a patrimony of, of humanity. Uh, and, and, and humans will come from all corners of, of the universe where humans have now, you know, proliferated and, and grown to visit their point of origin, where they came from. And that is going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing. This planet uh, will hopefully will be preserved for the future, for the future generations to know and learn. Now, that means we have to endeavor today to take care of it because we're not doing so well. All you have to do is look around you these days with all the changes that are going on in our atmosphere and the, and the climate that we um, are doing some severe damage to, to our home planet. As citizens of the earth, we uh, have the responsibility to protect you know, this one spaceship, the only one that we have. This may seem like an, an obvious answer to you, but I want to give a piece of advice to those who are watching, how they can embrace diversity and inclusion in their daily work, because you've been given such a vantage point to see things from a global view, literally, and as a global citizen. How can we implement that in our daily lives when it comes to our workplace? Well, you know, diversity is, as you know, as the word, implies is options you know diversity means you have options you have many things to choose from and and that is the essence of why we we we, we want it if you go to the rainforest you see the diversity happening right right in front of you uh, all these different flowers and trees and plants and animals they're all sort of interconnected and they all change and grow and 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 
and evolve into other things. And, and I mean, to me, diversity is, is, is really life. It's life itself. And to, to shut that off is, is to seal our demise and to seal our, our, our you know, nothingness, our, our disappearance. We need to encourage that diversity to continue because that is, that is the, the nature uh, of, human, of, of, of human evolution. So um, the more, the better. Can you talk a little bit now about the work that keeps you busy on the day-to-day and your company at Astro Rocket Company? We're trying to enable transportation in space to be fast, reliable, uh, and, and, uh, and sustainable, economically sustainable. So we're developing a transportation system, a propulsion system, an engine, a rocket engine, that is very different from the chemical engines of today. Um, you can imagine that today we, we are almost like a, in the horse and buggy uh, era of transportation as far as space is concerned. We use chemical, big chemical rockets to get us to and from space. We need um, you know, to, to develop essentially the railroad. Uh, the capability to deliver large quantities of supplies and people and and maintain a, a, a logistics supply chain to the moon, to Mars, to other places. <clears throat> and that requires a transportation paradigm shift. And that's what we're doing here in this company. We're developing a propulsion system that will enable you to go you know, from point A to point B in space much faster, which are, um, with, with much less fuel and, and much more sustainably, economically. That's what we're doing here. And your Costa Rican roots remain at the forefront. It's a big part and an important part of your identity. Can you speak to the 50-year plan to turn Costa Rica into a developed nation by mid-century? Well, in Costa Rica, uh, we are endeavoring to, to decarbonize the country. That is one of the goals of our company there. We have a small subsidiary in Costa Rica. We have, we have taken on the, the, um, the topic of uh, green hydrogen. In other words, uh, transform the energy matrix of Costa Rica from, from hydrocarbons, you know, petroleum-based fuels, diesel, gasoline, natural gas, and those things, uh, into uh, renewable energy, uh, hydrogen. Costa Rica has the, the advantage that it already has a very clean uh, electric grid. Costa Rica's electric grid is nearly 100% uh, renewable. That is, is very clean. However, the electric uh, energy in Costa Rica it's only 25% of the total energy the country consumes. Most of the energy in the country, the country uses, is in transportation. Trucks, buses, trains, cars, airplanes, all those things are still running on fossil fuels. And so our goal is to transform the transportation sector of Costa Rica from fossil-based to hydrogen banks. Hydrogen obtained from water, which we have plenty, and solar energy and wind energy, which we also have plenty. So we can decarbonize the whole economy. That is part of the 50-year plan that we're trying to put together. And we're in a hurry to do this uh, before the, the mid-century comes up. And well, certainly before I die. <laughs> We're going to talk about collaborating with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation by hosting local engineering interns in the field of hydrogen. And this is a passion project of yours. Can you elaborate on that? This is a program that we just started a, a couple of weeks ago. It's called the Hydrogen School. And it is aimed at um, young people who have have completed part of the secondary education, but are not have not gotten jobs or are not moving into into higher education. We want to we want to essentially create 
the um, labor force, um, the trained, the skilled labor force that is going to allow us to implement the hydrogen economy. And these are um, people with skills to do um, proper fittings, plumbing, welding, electronics, computer control, and all of these high technology um, jobs that are associated with implementing a hydrogen ecosystem. So the, the trained workforce, I'm not talking just Costa Rica, all over the world is lacking. And, and this is a, a, a gap that we're finding uh, worldwide in Costa Rica, we are addressing it probably for the first time, and we're probably one of the pioneer countries um, moving into this um, training environment, just to start getting these young people, you know, working alongside the engineers at, at Astra Rocket Company to learn the old-fashioned way by doing, you know, um, side by side with the with the experts. So they'll be like apprentice in an apprenticeship type. Um, and that is the best way to teach. What a beautiful opportunity for these young interns. When you look back at your career, what lessons related to your grit, your perseverance, or even dealing with everyday failures, would you feel comfortable sharing? Maybe an instance where you thought, this is not going to happen. This is not going to work. Maybe you were tempted to call or write to dad and say, send me this one way ticket back. <laughs> yeah. What were those moments where you thought this is, this is not possible for me? How did you overcome that? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, if I look at my life, um, I'd say most of the time, most of the things that I've tried have failed, have failed. And, and I, I think that the, the, the message that I always try to give to the, the youngsters is that 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 in order to succeed you have you have to be you have to be ready to fail. Failure is a requirement for for success. And I know that uh, at, at NASA, um, you know, sometimes the the, the 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 motto is failure is not an option. It is an option. It is always an option. It is an option that you want to consider because you know you, you learn from that. I remember my uh, my thesis advisor at, at MIT said used to say, Franklin, if you do an experiment and it works perfectly, you have learned nothing. So, so it's like you really want things to fail because that's how you learn. That's how you find what not to do and how to change course. Now, you don't want failures to be so devastating that it completely kills you. Kills you. So you have to be careful about the kind of risks that you take. So one important approach that I have always taken has been that um, you make little steps, but more frequent, rather than gigantic leaps, you know, every blue moon, you know. So sometimes people get paralyzed by analyzing every potential um, option or um, result from 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 a step, and you know, at the end of the day, you just have to take the step. You just have to go and do it, and and then you'll find out. Now, you need to know that if you make a small step um, and you fail, you're not going to die, and so you're going to be bruised, and you're going to be really hurt. Uh, you're going to be out of money, or you're going to be somewhere you don't want to be, but uh, hey, so be it. That's part of life. So the lesson is multiple um, steps, small steps, uh, very frequent, rather than leaps, um, infrequent. You have such a great mental toughness about you, and I think that's gonna be the biggest takeaway. There's so many fascinating things about your life, your culture, your history, but your mental toughness is really resonating here, and I think about your times of space travel. You have to have mental toughness. I can't imagine that you could do the assignments that you've done without having that piece activated. How did you learn that, or have you always had it? 
Well, I've I've been always um, maybe that's one one of the things I was I was you know made made with. Um, I, I, I tend to be extremely stubborn. Uh, I, I don't give up. It's very hard to get me to to give up. Um, so that uh, maybe stubbornness has gotten me far. Um, now you you want to carefully manage that uh, stubbornness, not to be at a point where you just, you know, beat yourself against the wall, knowing that it's just going to be the same result over and over. And, and you know, you, you, it's at that end. You, you have to know when to change and when to take a course correction and when to, you know, when to adapt and, and make things a little different. But uh, persistence has been, uh, a trait that I, I must have inherited from somebody in my family. Um, I, I didn't grow it myself. I, I just probably came, came from the factory with, with, with it. In the season of life that you're in, having accomplished so much and you've got passion projects ahead of you, what are you most excited about personally for what's next? Well, I tell, <laughs> I tell people, that I feel like I never grew up. You know, I'm still like a little kid going to play in my playpen every every day and looking forward to it. I got all my toys and <laughs> and to me, go, 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 coming to work here is is is, is not like work. I mean, I, I look forward to it. I, I I get up in the morning. Hey, I'm I'm getting ready to go to this rocket laboratory. I'm going to be I'm building rockets, <laughs> doing all this. You know, doing all this technology is, is, is really, to me, is very energizing. I just wish everyone felt like I do, you know, going, getting up in the morning to, to you know, to tackle a problem like, like, like what I'm trying to do. It is, it's, just, it's just like a little kid that uh, never grew up. What do you hope is next for space exploration? I think that the next thing is, um, and it's already happening, is is that the private sector is going to take on an increasingly important role in the business of space. The, the, you know, there's a lot of interesting business opportunities that are going to develop for all of humanity in space. And uh, next to that, uh, we will be um, returning to the moon but this time um, to stay, to, to develop uh, habitats and, and a permanent presence of humans, again, very much uh, uh, with the private sector, uh, very engaged in this whole process. And then on to other planets, Mars uh, beckons and beyond that, uh, the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn, and, and the rest of the solar system. So that, to me, are the steps that are coming down, down the line. The future looks absolutely uh, enticing and beautiful for young people. Uh, I wish maybe sometimes that I could be another high school student again and repeat this uh, journey one more time because it was so much fun. It was so, so en enjoyable and, and, and so great. Um, with all these pitfalls and problems, I still would, would not change anything. Can you leave us with maybe a, a story of your, a time when you were looking back down on planet Earth while you were away, something that really just resonated with you? Give us a, another good uh, think in pictures story, if you could, of, of what your day-to-day -day was like and what you saw. Well, I was, I was um, you know, when I first went into space, uh, the, the first thing I wanted to do, wanted to do was unbuckle uh, and, 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 you know, <laughs> experience the weightlessness that everybody says that's there. And sure enough, unbuckled and, and I was out flo floating. And I, oh, wow, this is really something. And, um, and then the next thing you want to do, every astronaut is, is like that. You want to go look out the window. And I tell you, um, the first time I ever saw the Earth, I have to say, it is the most beautiful thing that you ever saw. I don't think there's anything that compares 
no photograph, no you know high resolution image of, or video um, compares to the sensation of looking at your planet, where you know your family lives, your your loved ones, all the people are there. Some of them fighting, some of them having fun. Uh, uh, they're all there, and you are you know you're here far. It gives you a sense of tremendous um, power for one end, and it makes you feel very small at the same time. Those two, those two sensations, and and the other just great experience for me was the first time I walked outside of the spacecraft for for just because of luck. Uh, I was uh, riding on the end of the uh, of the robotic arm, um, about fifty feet away from the from the spacecraft, and we went into the night. And we were flying over the South Pacific, and um, we crossed uh, the Aurora Australis, uh, and I was I, I flew right through it, and I could see all these uh, you know if beautiful colors of plasma all around me. I just thought I was in some kind of a dream. It was an, it was a, an amazing, uh, just an uh, amazing experience. Uh, and every time I remember it, that just gives me goosebumps. Just you telling it gives me goosebumps. It must seem when you're experiencing at that heightened level, everything else seems a little less significant. All of the day to day, all of the things we analyze, all the things we stress about when you're at that global scale, seeing what you saw. It really helps just put the day-to-day -day in perspective. That is correct. They, they, they call it the overview effect. And I highly encourage it. I hope you get a chance to experience it. Dr. Chang Diaz, I love how you perfectly illustrated from your vantage point, being in space, that you truly feel like not just a citizen of the US, but a global citizen. I think we can all take away that nugget of truth in our everyday lives and see ourselves for the differences, for the parts that may not always go smoothly, thinking of ourselves as one unit operating together global citizen. And on behalf of 7-Eleven family of brands, Dr. Franklin Chang-Diaz, thank you so much for celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month with us. Mm -hmm.